Hello and welcome to this graphics tutorial about casting shadows, which have recently become one of my favourite areas in computer graphics. Because it takes such a long time to explain every line of code in detail, I'm only going to briefly describe the most key parts of the code. But if you're new to programming or you'd like to experiment with the various features, then you can copy and paste the code from the link in the description and compile it yourself. The only slight catch is that you'll need to draw your own models in Blender and make sure the mesh numbers correspond correctly in the shaders. Or if you'd like a copy of the model shown in the video, then please let me know and I'll send you a download link. I'll start by demonstrating a simple Blender model which I'm using throughout this tutorial as the background scene. The technique that I'm using for casting shadows is in principle surprisingly straightforward. We render the scene from the light's point of view which provides us with the closest screen space depth value and then store that value in the shadow map texture, which itself is written to by the frame buffer during this first render run. The second render run uses the player's camera as usual to render the scene, but with the key additional step as follows. We then compare the light shadow map depth value of the scene from the first run to the current part of the scene being rendered during the second run, but also as from the light's point of view, instead of from the player's point of view. And then if the light's first run depth value proves to be closer to its own position than its depth value of this second run, the current part of the scene being rendered is in shadow. To create the shadow map which gets written to during the first render run, we need to use a custom defined frame buffer instead of OpenGL's default frame buffer. Instead of rendering all the data that's required to produce a coloured fragment on the screen, we instead record just the depth value which is needed for the depth testing as previously explained. The shadow map itself exists as a texture that is attached to the custom frame buffer. Also note that apart from needing to create a custom frame buffer, declaring and formatting the texture itself is similar to as demonstrated in tutorial 4, loading textures. The key difference being that GL depth component is used as an argument when calling the GL texture image 2D function, instead of a colour format such as GL red green blue alpha. We then proceed to initialize the uniform variables which are all used within the shaders. Notice that some of the uniforms relating to the shadow map and the lighting are arrays, which allows for more than one light to be processed. It's worth noting that for a perspective projection, the homogeneous coordinates are clipped in clip space after first having been transformed by the projection matrix in the vertex shader, and then perspective division is performed to convert them to normalized device coordinate space which are then further converted to screen space. Also note that for an orthographic projection, the perspective division doesn't apply. Next I'll demonstrate shadow smoothing by using PCF, which stands for percentage closer filtering. Notice that after reducing the map width and map height from 1500 to 500, the resolution of the shadows becomes very blocky, which is because the depth values of multiple fragments are each being compared to the same depth map value, of which there are now far fewer. After the PCF steps value is increased from 0 to 3, the shadows become much smoother, but also blurred. Therefore you need to have sufficiently high resolution shadow maps if you like well defined sharp shadows. And then by using just the minimum PCF value of 1, you can get very nice results. And here's a miserable shadow map resolution of just 100, and with the PCF still set at 3. But it is pretty bad. Another important aspect to consider is the so-called erroneous self-shadowing, which is a term used synonymously with shadow acne. Transforming the same vertex data with the same view and projection matrices should ideally produce exactly the same value, but other factors are at play. Apparently, the complete rendering process of the graphics pipeline as executed during the first rendering run produces slightly different results to when manually calculating the depth values during the second render run, and it's this precision issue that causes the shadow acne patterns. One technique is to offset by a very small amount either the depth map Z value or the Z value that we've calculated manually in the fragment shader, which can produce very good results. Also, why should increasing the resolution fix the problem anyway? Even if the discrepancy between the two methods of determining the depth values becomes reduced for higher resolution shadow maps, perhaps due to some reason such as each method converges towards the same value, being limited only by how high the resolution is set, higher resolution still won't be any closer to infinity. Here's a demonstration of the difference in self-shadowing for a shadow map of 100 by 100 texels versus 4000 by 4000 texels, keeping the bias setting the same. But as you can see, although the acne looks finer in detail, it's not exactly what we'd call better.
Note that if what's being displayed on screen is anything other than stationary scene objects, and also that the cameras are not moving, then the bias value should be changed dynamically based on factors such as the near and far plane distances from the objects casting shadows. Also note that too much biasing can result in what's known as Peter Panning, whereby the shadows look detached from the objects. We can examine the non-linear characteristic of the depth buffer by overriding the fragment colours, setting them to specific colours. I've set five colour strips, each which covers 10% of the total depth buffer. 0.5 to 0.6 at the near end is bright green, 0.9 to 1.0 at the far end is bright red, but the first 50% isn't coloured in at all. As the camera travels over the top, two things happen. The floor becomes further away from the light camera and the varying slope of differing depth values becomes flattened out. We can also enable the light strustum to be displayed, thereby showing the boundaries of the volume that is rendered by the camera. Also notice that I've now enabled the colouring to apply to all the scene objects, instead of only to the floor. We can also disable the depth tests that restrict shadows from being displayed beyond the frustum's near and far planes, although only objects depths that reside within the frustum will be added to the depth maps when rendered. This next part shows how to adjust the lighting percentage and shadow darkness variables, which as it is now affects all lights the same, but could easily be modified to apply different values for each light individually. All the demonstrations so far have been using perspective projection matrices for the light's camera, but this example is now using an orthographic projection matrix which produces a fundamentally different view of each model, and therefore their resulting shadows. You can also play around with enabling and commenting the relevant lines of code within the main loop, which enables you to use one or multiple lights. Next I'll run the same program again, but zoomed out, and with the frustum and near and far planes enabled, which nicely reveals the frustum boundaries. The depth buffer's non-linear characteristic as demonstrated earlier when using a perspective projection is now being revealed in the same colourful way but by using an orthographic projection. If you find these demonstrations interesting then please click on the like button and you can also subscribe to my channel which would be really helpful. Each colour corresponds to 10% of the depth buffer's range exactly as before, starting from green at 50% and continuing to red at 100%. Next, I've added just a few lines of code to rotate the view matrix, which is updated during the main loop. The result is that we can now see the whole scene rotating. By using a small fix to avoid two frustums clipping each other, it's possible to display two lights, each with their own frustum volume displayed in a different colour. And as well as viewing the scene at an angle, we can of course also look from directly above. Before the final program run demonstration, I'll briefly explain what's happening in the shaders. Within the vertex shader we have 8 new variables, 7 of which are uniforms and 5 of which are arrays. After the model number uniform has been used to identify each model, thereby applying the correctly corresponding transformation matrix, we then have what for me, conceptually, is probably the single most key line of code, whereby within the for loop, each light's projection matrix is multiplied by the model matrix and also the vertex position, which is then passed to the fragment shader. Notice that this line takes us back to near the beginning of the video, during which the animated hand draws attention to the light's view of the scene. Within the fragment shader we have six new variables, five of which are uniforms and three of which are arrays. The first block of code stops the frustums and near and far planes from being rendered during the shadow map draw calls. The next part is the small fix that I mentioned which stops the frustums from clipping each other for when using more than one light. Perspective division is then applied manually to the vertex positions as seen from the light's point of view, which have been passed in from the vertex shader. Next is the bias control, which calculates to be a higher value the more square on the light shines onto the given mesh face. The PCF shadow smoothing works by cycling through a pair of nested for loops, which together result in sampling the step size as a block of texel values as read from the shadow map texture. The accumulated value is then divided by the number of sampled positions, which is what produces the feathering at the edges of the shadows. The lighting calculations remain the same as in the previous tutorials, although there are now the light percent and shadow factor variables, which are used together to produce the lighting multiplier variable. The depth value check can be disabled to allow the shadow math's depth values to be compared to position values that reside beyond the thrust and planes. The vertex's normalised device coordinates, x, y and z values are compared to OpenGL's minus 1 to plus 1 coordinate space, which easily allows the lighting and shadowing effects to be restricted to within the frustum boundaries, 
which is shown in the final video demo in just a few moments. Next, we can set the light's near and far planes and front face, colours and transparency values. We then have the block of code that produces the colour strips, which represent the depth buffer values. And finally, we use the same if statement as already used further up, but this time to clip the draw call rendering of the Frustum models.